Okay, I think that uh, we we can uh, we can start. Um, welcome everybody to this uh, uh, Tuesday lecture in the uh, program of uh, Tuesday lectures uh, of the uh, SOAS Middle East uh, Institute. Uh, we are also joined by the the two uh, directors of of the institute, where probably uh, you can see their names on on the screen. Um, and uh, we are uh, uh, very glad to 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 introduce this uh, this evening this this talk very special one and uh, given the the record number of of uh, people who registered for it that's uh, a major event in the series very obviously uh, we have the, the the privilege of of welcoming uh, this this evening uh, professor uh, mahmoud mamdani who, uh, as pro you, you probably know, or you surely know, I think he doesn't really need to be introduced, but uh, well, he is a professor of government and of uh, anthropology and of Middle Eastern, South Asian and African studies, M-E-S-A-S, -S, at uh, Columbia University. That's beating us, so S-O-A-S. -S. So there it's uh, more, even more detailed. Um, and he's also the director of the Macarini, Macariri sorry, Institute of Social Research in uh, Kampala. Uh, we are uh, having, we're lucky to have uh, uh, Mahmoud Mamdanis this evening for to present his uh, latest book, Neither, not, neither Settler Nor Native, The Making and Unmaking of Permanent Minorities which is a very stimulating book and uh, which I recommend to, to, to everyone who is uh, with, here with us. Very interesting book, very interesting read, as I'm sure uh, you will uh, uh, understand if you haven't read the book yet uh, through the presentation uh, of this uh, evening. And uh, without further any further delay, uh, I give the floor. I mean, usually I would have uh, expected uh, uh, applauses for, for uh, our guest, but the uh, only thing we can do on Zoom is just to invite him to speak. So Mahmoud, please, the floor is to yours. Thank you very much, Gilbert. Um, thank you to all those uh, who are on Zoom uh, attending and, uh, and those on uh, Facebook or, or other media. Um, let me begin by talking about the book. Uh, this is a book about the nation state and about post-colonial modernity. The nation state was born in Iberia in 1492. The cleansing of the nation, quote, one country, one people, one religion, set fire to relations between majority and minorities within the same state. It set in motion processes of ethnic cleansing of Muslims and Jews. The liberal solution was the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. Two key concepts of the modern state were born at Westphalia, religious toleration at home and the reciprocal guarantee of sovereignty abroad. The liberal solution was put forward in John Locke's treatise on tolerance. Catholics can be tolerated if they renounce any political support of the Pope or of any power outside England. Locke formulated the key tenets of the liberal theory of the nation state. Only the majority has sovereignty. The minority must not participate in sovereignty. The liberal notion of the nation state turned majority and minority into permanent political identities. This was the original sin. This book explores the export of the notion of different kinds of citizens, sovereign and non-sovereign, from the US to South Africa and Nazi Germany, and finally to Israel. This is a book about the United States as a founding experience in modern colonialism and about the reservation, the Indian reservation, as the site where core institutions of modern colonialism were forged. 
It's also a book about extreme violence as a consequence of modern nation state building in the post colonies. Should we think of extreme violence as the consequence of a criminal project, the criminal model popularized by Nuremberg, or as a political project, a notion born of the transition from apartheid in South Africa? What can we learn from the failure of denazification and the relative success of post-apartheid South Africa? Finally, the book asks, what is transportable in the South African experience? What does South Africa have to teach us? To answer this question, the last chapter takes a fresh look. I look through South African lenses at Israel-Palestine, the most intractable contemporary political problem in today's world. In this talk today, I'd like to comment on four issues. First, for a start, since I am speaking from New York City, two different ways of modern subjugation, colonial conquest and racial domination. Second, the difference between an immigrant and a settler. Third, what it means to think of political identity as historical, born of a particular form of the state, as opposed to as natural, permanent and trans-historical. And finally, the need to decouple the nation and the state as we seek an alternative to the nation state. I'll begin with the US, American Indians and African Americans. What's in a name? How should we call the pre-Columbian resident communities of the Americas? as Indians or as natives. Indian is the name Columbus gave peoples of the new world. Native is a description that the US government and the peoples they colonized do not accept. The museum dedicated to the pre-Columbian civilizations in the Americas is called the National Museum of the American Indian. What difference would it make if the National Museum of the American Indian is called the National Museum of the Native American? Why is it that the 1964 Civil Rights Act in the US did not apply, did not apply to Indians in reservations? So that a separate Indian Civil Rights Act had to be passed in 1968. But the two acts are not the same. The 1964 Act is constitutionally binding, whereas the 1968 Indian Act is only advisory. Reservation Indians are not and have never been rights-bearing citizens of the United States in a constitutional sense. There were no reservations before the United States. The reservation was the creation of the United States. The reservation is a separate polity, separate from the United States. The Europeans who came to America were not immigrants, they were settlers. What is the difference? Immigrants come to join existing polities, whether they seek equality or advantage in it. Settlers come to displace existing polities and to establish their own exclusive sovereignty. Indian reservations are not part of the sovereign state we call the United States. In the words of Chief Justice John Marshall in 19th century, reservations are domestic dependent colonies. Politically, the term Indian tribal sovereignty masks colonial domination. Reservation Indians are legally wards of Congress. Reservation authorities are overseen by a vast federal bureaucracy known as the Bureau of Indian Affairs. It is no different from the colonial bureaucracy that governed any indirect rule colony in Africa. The Indian reservation was part of a two-state solution. The two-state solution, a sovereign state alongside a non-sovereign protectorate, was Lincoln's contribution to the second half of 
in the second half of the 19th century. It claimed to provide a permanent solution for Indians who had survived the genocide. America also originated the notion of differentiated citizenship with only some participating in sovereignty. Until 1921, Indians were nationals, but not citizens. After that, Indians had to be naturalized as citizens. They had first to be purged as members of the Indian polities before they could be naturalized as US citizens. Colonized Indians and African slaves, two different minority solutions with radically different consequences. Reservation Indians have a different relationship to the US from that of African Americans. One is based on colonial conquest, the other on racial domination. Racial and colonial domination are not the same, even if racial discrimination is common to both. Economically, the American Indian symbolized land which has been stolen. The American slave embodied captive and coerced labor. Politically, Indians were governed in a protectorate as part of a two-state solution. African slaves were racially segregated within a one-state polity. The one-state solution provided a political frame for the development of the struggle against Jim Crow and racial domination. Even if it has been preceded by fits and start, sometimes even receded, the one state framework has made possible the development of alliances. The two, the two state solution explains the continued isolation and colonial subjugation of the reservation Indians. The American model was exported to a number of places, among these South Africa, Germany, and Israel. I'll begin with South Africa. South African settlers attained state independence in 1910. A delegation visited North America, USA, and Canada two years later to study how Indians were governed. Three key elements of governance were imported to South Africa, homeland, traditional authority, and customary law. Every tribe must be territorially contained in a homeland, even if only a remnant of the lands occupied by the people was designed, designated as their homeland. Every homeland must be administered by a homeland authority, sanctioned as traditional, and thus, not subject to being elected. This traditional authority must enforce a customary law on the homeland with one proviso that custom be excised of all practices or notions that settlers considered repugnant to civilization. I will discuss the lessons of the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa after a discussion of Germany and Israel. South Africa was not the only one that learned from the US. So did Nazi Germany and Hitler. Hitler learned much. He learned first that genocide is doable and therefore thinkable. And then he learned that there can be a second and a third class citizenship as of African-Americans, Indian citizens after 1921, Puerto Ricans later. Part of the German pr preparation for drafting Nuremberg laws was the study of American citizenship laws, a learning process documented by James Q. Whitman of Yale in his book, Hitler's American Model. Nazism was a striving for a purified nation state, one that would go beyond distinguishing between a national majority and a national minorities, but also expunge the nation of its minorities so as to purify it. Denazification after World War II failed because the Allies shut their eyes to the political project that inspired and propelled Nazism. There was an American debate on Nazism after the Second World War. Was Germany liberated or occupied? Was Nazism a state project or a social project? Who should be held responsible for Nazism? 
the nation or the state, Nazi leaders or the German people. The American consensus was that responsibility for Nazism lay with the German people. At Nuremberg and after, millions were considered criminally culpable, yet Nazism was never probed as a political project. A similar debate unfolded in Germany, particularly among German left intellectuals, the most prominent being Franz Neumann and Herbert Marcuse. Their answer, Nazism was neither just a national project nor just a state project, but a project of the nation state, a project of both the Nazi state and the folk nation to eradicate the state territory of national minorities, Jews, Roma, and others. Nazism was above all a political project. Denazification would thus require allies to support internal anti-fascist anti -fascist committees, but Americans were unwilling to do so. Only the Soviets were willing in the East, but only temporarily, not after the Berlin uprising. Unlike the criminal model, which understands violence as the result of antisocial acts of individual perpetrators, I focus on extreme violence as an outcome of group mobilization against disenfranchised minorities or majorities in the nation state. Rather than individualize the violence as a standalone act, I point to cycles of violence sustained by groups mobilized as so many constituencies. Rather than catalog atrocities so as to name, shame and punish its perpetrators, I seek to modify the issues around which constituencies are mobilized. Rather than exclude perpetrators from the political process, I seek to include them along with all survivors, victims, perpetrators, beneficiaries, bystanders. I use the term survivor, not as the Zionists use them or the post Holocaust survivors did, nor as the term is used in Rwanda. I use the term survivor to refer to all those who survived extreme violence, not just victims who survived, but all who survived the catastrophe. Let me turn to Israel. Are Jewish people in Israel settlers or immigrants? The Jewish population of Mandate Palestine belonged to three groups. First, there were those who had never left. They were part of the natives of Palestine. Then there were those who returned on a pilgrimage seeking a religious homeland. They were content to be part of the existing polity. This was the first alia of immigrants. And then there were those who wanted their own exclusive polity, a Jewish nation state in place of the existing polity. They came in the second and the third alia. These were the settlers. The Zionist striving for a nation state cannot be understood unless we also grasp the lesson they drew from Germany. Victims of the nation state project in Germany and in Europe, Zionists decided to set up a nation state in Eretz Israel. The first Zionist project was to reduce the Palestinians from a majority to a minority. This was the Nakba and then to demonize the minority as a demographic threat so as to further cut down its numbers. In other words, the Nakba continues. Palestinians inside Israel cannot participate in sovereignty. They have rights, even political rights, including the right to vote, but they cannot participate in power. The clarity of this vision is the transfer from Israel as a Jewish and democratic state to Israel as a Jewish state. The debate on one state versus two state solution means the following. One state solution would be akin to direct racial domination. The two state solution would lead to indirect colonialism under Zionist rule through creating a protectorate. In American terms, these alternatives are represented by the African slave and the colonized Indian. 
For a third alternative, we have to look at the South African transition from apartheid. In South Africa, the real transition, the transition, the politics that led us to 1994 took place in the 1970s. Prior to 1970, anti-apartheid politics reproduced the architecture of apartheid. Each racial group organized itself as defined by apartheid power separately. Africans organized as African National Congress, Indians as Indian Congress of Natal, Coloreds at Colored People's Congress, and whites, since they could not organize as Congress of Whites, they organized as Congress of Democrats. Apartheid's ideological hold on the oppressed population was broken in the 1970s. The key initiative came from the student movement, white and black. Black students under Biko left the liberal white student organization and formed their own separate body, organized township dwellers, starting with Soweto. Radical white students left in the wilderness turned to organizing hostile workers on the fringes of townships. The turning point in anti-apartheid politics was not the armed struggle, but the strikes that began in Durban in 1973 and the uprising in Soweto in 1976. Behind this was a change of a changing mindset known first as black consciousness. Biko said black is not a color. If you're oppressed, you are black. Black consciousness could have led to other outcomes. It could have led to a nation state consciousness claiming that South Africa is a black nation, thus essentializing black as a natural identity. Instead, it led to an epistemological awakening that political identity is historical, not natural. Afrikaners made a journey from being junior partners of British colonialism to becoming a part of the anti-apartheid coalition. In 1994, Afrikaners divided with a minority asking for a homeland where Afrikaners could have their own state. The South African moment was born in the 17 and 80s through a series of transformations. One was a transformation from opposition to apartheid to offering an alternative to apartheid. Second was a transition from a state of the majority, from calling for a state of the majority, the national majority, the black majority, to calling for a state of all the oppressed. And finally, was the transition from opposition to whites to opposition to white power. 1994 was the birth of a new political community, a community of survivors. People are aware that there was no social justice in 1994. What happened in 1994 was the birth of a new political community, one that provides political equality as the basis for a struggle for social equality. I argue that political decolonization and with it epistemological decolonization has to come before economic decolonization. I return to Israel-Palestine. At the core of political Zionism is the effort to build not just a Jewish religious community in the Holy Land, but a Jewish state. This is an essential distinction whose erasure, whose erasure gets to the heart of the matter. The conflation of society with state is the foundation of the nation state and its program of rule by the permanent national majority. The nation state may call itself a democracy as Israel does, but the majority is not actually determined through political process, through political contestation. Rather, the majority is defined pre-politically as it is the nation itself. So if the nation is the majority, then who is a member of the nation? 
who is a Jew? The most fundamental of Israel's unanswered questions is who is a Jew? If Israel is to be a state for Jews only, it must answer the question of who is a Jew. Its answer cannot avoid flattening the diversity of world Jewry into the Jewry sanctioned by the state. At the legal level, the question has bedeviled Israeli authorities since the law of return was passed in 1950. Is a Jew defined by religion or ethnicity? Are Jews members of a religious community or are they a nationality? or both. As a result, the state of Israel now has two legal definitions of who is a Jew. The narrow definition provided by the Halakha, Jewish religious law, which Israeli law enforces in the sphere of personal affairs, and the broad definition of the amended law of return. As the political, at the political and social level, Judaization eliminates unacceptable forms of Jewishness. The acceptable form is associated with Ashkenazim, who traced their lineage to Yiddish speaking parts of Europe. Ashkenazim were the founders of the state who embraced the role of civilizers, committed to bringing other Jews into line with the national ideal. In particular, Ashkenazim have sought to civilize Mizrahim, Arab Jews. The Mizrahim are the Arab Jews. They present special challenge to Zionism for Zionism presumes that Arab and Jewish identity are both incompatible and indelibly hostile towards one another. Otherwise, there would be no need of a Jewish state in historic Palestine. In the Zionist worldview, Palestinians are Canaanites who never left home. They are squatters, not natives. With the return of the native, the squatter must get out of the way to make room. The Palestinian resistance led to multiple shifts in the Palestinian liberation movement. From an early focus on armed struggle, the first and second intifadas and subsequent Palestinian mobilization in Israel in the occupied territories has moved to a demand for political change. The goal has been to undo the Jewish state and replace it with a, quote, state of all its citizens. To fragment their ranks, Israel has fractured Palestinians into three disconnected groups. Palestinian citizens of Israel, Palestinians in the occupied territories, and Palestinian refugees. The development of a Palestinian consciousness straddling these three groups has been an outcome of a protracted process whose focus and center of gravity have shifted radically over time. From exile to home, and from an all out or nothing demand for Israel's disintegration to a demand for involvement in the Israeli political process. Organizationally, this has involved a threefold transition. At first, Displaced Palestinians looked, for, looked to Arab frontline states to be their protectors and liberators. After these Arab states were defeated in 1967, Palestinians turned to the nascent and exile-led PLO, an armed resistance movement. After Israel crushed the PLO in 1982 Lebanon war, Palestinians finally looked inward. The first intifada in the late 1980s solidified the internalization of Palestinian leadership and reflected a definitive rejection of the failed armed resistance of the external leadership that the external leadership like to talk about. The second intifada beginning in 2000 brought together Palestinians in Israel and the occupied territories under a single movement. Both intifadas responded to the failings of the official Palestinian liberation movement under the aegis of the PLO. The second in particular reflected frustration over the PLO's capitulation to Zionism at the Oslo Accords of 1993 and the onward rush of settlement that followed it. In 1982, Israel went to war in Lebanon, the purpose of which was in fact total war against the Palestinians. The Lebanon war was the brainchild of Ariel Sharon, then the defense minister. The IDF deployed well over 120,000 troops for over 10 weeks. 
It was the country's largest mobilization since the 1973 war. This is according to Rashid Khalid. Outgunned and overwhelmed, the PLO withdrew to Tunis. But while the PLO was defeated, Sharon's strategic objective remained unrealized. Instead, the war intended to suppress Palestinian nationalism only stoked it further. With the exiled armed resistance smashed, the moment was ripe for political mobilization at home. Arafat made two crucial compromises at Oslo. First, he tacitly accepted settlements in the West Bank. Second, he explicitly accepted Israel's stranglehold over the economy and sovereignty of the occupied territories, even going so far as to agree that this stranglehold would persist in a future Palestinian state. The success of the Second Intifada led to mobilization under Balad, National Democratic Alliance, a political party led at the time of the Second Intifada by Azmi Bishara, a Palestinian member of the Knesset. The demand that Israel be a state of all its citizens was central to Balad's platform in the 1996 elections. On May 21, 2001, Bishara proposed a new basic law aimed at achieving this. The stated purpose of the bill, entitled Basic Law Arab Minority as a National Minority, was to enshrine in law the status of the Arab minority in Israel as a national minority enlightened, entitled to collective rights and complete civil equality. In the months that followed, Bishara presented another bill countering the false claim that Israel is a democratic state. It did so by asking the Knesset to rewrite that assertion in its basic law and instead affirm that Israel is a state of all its citizens. Whereas Bishara's first bill sought equal rights for the national minority, now he was asking the Knesset explicitly to negate the existence of the national minority by also negating that of the national majority by rejecting the idea that Israel is a nation state, a state of the Jewish people, the national majority. Over the past decade, Palestinian politics has moved from an engagement predominantly internal to one predominantly external. The internal engagement called for a state of all its citizens as a counter to the Zionist project for a Jewish state. The external engagement takes the form of an international boycott of Israeli state and society under BDS. To the extent that BDS calls for the de-Zionization of the state of Israel, there is reason to give it enthusiastic support. But BDS also needs to learn from the experience of the South African case, that of divestment and boycott, which it claims to build on. As a participant in the anti-apartheid boycott, I came to realize that its key mistake was to collapse state regime and society into a seamless whole. What I came to understand was that indiscriminate boycotts do not work. The strategy of isolating the state internationally must be aligned with a domestic strategy to isolate the pro-state forces in civil society while backing those that would dismantle it. In other words, to differentiate between Zionist and non-Zionist, not just anti-Zionist elements in Jewish society. On a broader level, we, including Palestinians and anti-Zionist Israelis, need to draw two lessons from the South African struggle. As in South Africa, in Israel too, this means overcoming two categories of division. The first is the division among victims of the nation state. In South Africa, the population was divided among township dwellers and Bantustan residents, a barrier overcome by migrant laborers with the aid of radical white student organizers. The victimized population was also divided racially and tribally. The racial barrier was overcome by black consciousness movement, while the tribal barrier has yet to be overcome. Among the Palestinians, there is a tripartite division of victims, those living in the diaspora, the occupied territories and Israel proper. Each of these groups has been further differentiated. The diaspora includes those in the refugee camps and those beyond. 
residents of the occupied territories are split between the West Bank and Gaza, and colonized citizens of Israel include Arabs, Druze, and Bedouin. Each microgroup is subject to different political regimes designed to produce a different specific subjectivity. The second phase in South Africa led to winning over a sizable number of apartheid supporters. That will be harder in Israel. That said, we cannot forget the ground shifted from under the apartheid state with Afrikaners who provided most of the foot soldiers for apartheid's machinery of repression opened up to an alternative to the apartheid order. The lesson is that no political identity is permanent. But whereas BDS con can contribute to Israel's international isolation, something else is needed if a non-Zionist alternative is to bloom in Israel itself. Like in South Africa, that something else is an epistemic revolution that will open the way to a political one. Phase two of the Palestinian moment will come when it is not just the oppressed who seek political change, but also many of the supporters of oppression today. Getting there will require a new kind of political consciousness within Israel, a consciousness based on the recognition that the flourishing of Jews and Jewish life does not require political Zionism. Apartheid fell because of a confluence of two developments. The better known of these is the anti-apartheid uprising in the townships. The anti-apartheid struggle brought diverse groups under a single umbrella. The result was not a victory, but a deadlock. A deadlock. Why did the National Party choose to go to the negotiating table? Because it had begun to lose the support of most sections of the Boer intelligentsia. And thus they could read the writing on the wall. This intelligentsia was convinced that whites did not need to monopolize political power to have a home in South Africa. It is this lesson that needs to be driven home to Israelis, as many as possible, that Jews do not need to have a Jewish state to have a secure home in Israel-Palestine. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mahmoud, for this uh, very interesting talk. and. Uh, Actually, we have uh, uh, um, only a few questions until now, which uh, is something I, I wasn't expecting. I was expecting much more. I presume they will come later, but this gives me the, the, the opportunity to act for a few minutes as a discussant and uh, put a few questions to you. Um, my first question is, I mean, you, in your book, uh, you basically praise, uh, very much the South African uh, model of transition, uh, the truth and reconciliation process and the rest that, that is presented or becomes in your book and even here in your talk, uh, the, 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 let's say that the positive uh, example, even though you recognize uh, limitations to the process uh, that, that happened. But uh, my, my first question to you is, is well, are these just uh, footnotes or marginal limitations, or are they much more than that? In the sense that uh, the the South African experience has uh, uh, got rid of apartheid in the right sense, in the formal right sense, in the political sense, but social economic apartheid is very present. I mean, anyone visiting South Africa can see it. I mean, it's very extremely visible. And uh, isn't that a major failure of the South African process pointing to, to uh, a, a strong uh, limitation? And my second question observation is related to the parallel or uh, between that you draw between South Africa and Israel-Palestine. Of course, this is something that has been going on the, the comparison and the, the use, for instance, of the, the, the notion of apartheid for Israel-Palestine is a, a result of this very old comparison, which goes back to the, 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 very, the early stages, actually, of uh, uh, after the foundation of the state of Israel. 
but uh, 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 I, I mean, there are major differences between the two cases, as you know, and these differences have major implications, which are uh, very, uh, which put uh, uh, limitations, limits to, to the validity of the comparison, uh, in my view. The, the one first major difference is that the South African case was not based on the expulsion of the original population, but on the subjugation of the original uh, uh, population. And that's a huge difference that which leads in the Palestinian case to what you note in your book, that you have a, a people uh, in three, one could say even more, uh, say even four now with the Gaza and West Bank distinction, but you have the, the Palestinian citizens of the Israeli state, you have the, those who are under uh, uh, de facto occupation in, in the West Bank and Gaza, and you have the, the diaspora, the refugees, uh, especially in Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria, and, uh, and beyond. And this creates a much more uh, complex issue where, for instance, uh, you can't dismiss the struggle before 82 as being external because that's also waged by Palestinians, by Palestinian refugees. You can say the center of gravity shifted from one part of the Palestinian population to another part of the Palestinian population. That's a different story, but that remains a Palestinian struggle and that's an important uh, issue. And the second major difference is the demographic balance is not at all the same. The white population, the white settler population in South Africa was a, a, a small minority, which is not the case of the Jewish Israeli population uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, I mean, on the territory, uh, even if you take the, the 48 territory of, uh, of, uh, of Palestine. And, and uh, that again creates a much more complex issue uh, to which you can add the fact that you have different cultures, languages, and all that, even at the level of official. English is the, 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 the language of the South African state. I, I, I mean, in the state of, uh, when it comes to Israel, Palestine, you can also already see the problem. And the final uh, um, remark about that is taking the South African example as a model to criticize the BDS the, 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 on the Palestinian issue. Uh, I think also has its limitations, because what does it mean to make a distinction between pro-state and anti-state Israeli uh, institutions and Israeli uh, um, uh, companies? I mean, when it comes to investment, the, 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 the movement is against investment, against a project, anything that can be seen as contributing to, the, to upholding economically a settler colonial state. Uh, which functions uh, as such. How do you want the movement to make distinctions? I mean, we make distinctions when it comes to the academic, uh, as you know, I presume, uh, the academic uh, boycott, which is part of VDS. And we make distinction between the institutions and the individuals. And so the boycott is not about individually, individual Israelis. It's about institutions. It's about whatever constitutes the, 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 the economy and the political body of a state that is in its essence, a, a settler colonial state. So these are just a few comments. I don't want to abuse of, uh, of uh, my uh, position as chair, but I'm acting here as a kind of discussant. And I, I will offer you the, 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 to, to reply first before sh uh, moving to the questions of the uh, participants, which have increased as expected. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think these are wonderful questions. Um, and I think they uh, they get to the heart of the of the argument in the book. Um, do I offer the South African model as a transition, and do I have the notion of a South African model which is non-contradictory? Um, no. Uh, the South African model has inside it two very different roads. I do not offer the TRC as part of the model. Uh, the TRC actually was based on the Nuremberg model. Uh, the TRC was about uh, acknowledging crimes 
uh, but foregoing punishment. Uh, and I have a very sharp critique of the TRC in the book. Uh, I contrast the TRC uh, to CODESA, uh, the negotiations, the political process, the negotiations that took place. And I argue uh, that the political process moved South Africa to a very different role. Um, second question. Uh, South Africans got rid of apartheid, formal legal apartheid, but not of its social and economic consequences. You're absolutely right. You know, there's a larger discussion and the larger discussion is based on the question of uh, decolonization. It has been a discussion in Africa, but it's also been a discussion, I think, throughout the third world, um, which is how do we understand the political independence that took place in Africa in the 1950s and the 1960s? Do we understand this as a step backwards? Do we understand it as a failure to do, to move forward at all? Or do we understand it as a partial success that we welcome? Do we celebrate the independence of the 1950s and 1960s, uh, but with eyes open and critical? In other words, with a clear understanding that not everything was achieved, but something was achieved. And that something that, that was achieved clarifies the situation and brings us to move forward. What was achieved in South Africa and what was not achieved? Is the glass half full or half empty? There is no shortage of books on the African continent which who, whose, 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 whose main line of argument is not yet revolution. There was no revolution in Tanzania. There was no revolution in Mozambique. There was no revolution in Angola. And now there was no revolution in South, in South Africa. Of course, there was no revolution. There was no revolution in either of these places. But did we, did we move forward at all on the plane of decolonization? I believe we did. We moved forward on the plane of political decolonization. And by political decolonization, I mean that we had misunderstood decolonization politically to be just freedom from external control, just restoring the sovereignty of the new state. But actually, if you look at the process of political colonization, far more important than control from the outside is what happens to the inside, is the way the political community is reconfigured inside is the creation of differences between the white areas and the Bantustans, the different political groups. You said it very eloquently in the case of Israel and Palestine, where the fragmentation is even higher. And how, how do you, you know, in the African case, I talk about the, the invention of two political identities, race on the one hand, uh, tribe on the other, other hand making both of these into pol politicized identities. And I discuss in detail the depoliticization of both of these. Now you're absolutely correct that the consequences of, of, of political apartheid remain to be addressed, but they remain to be addressed in a new situation where the vast majority of the, of, of the population now has formal political rights. It has the right to organize. It has the right to, to communicate its ideas. Um, it's a different situation. Uh, and in my view, in my view, uh, this struggle is further complicated or become different by the fact that uh, the rich, both the rich and the poor are now far more multiracial than they were before. Um, you have black empowerment has created a layer of rich black people and the white disempowerment has created more than a layer of, of, of poor white people. Um, and it's a new situation. So I do not deny what you say, but I have a slightly different 
interpretation of, of it. Um, parallels between South Africa and Israel and Palestine. Um, you're right, again, the South African case is not based on um, expulsion, but on subjugation. Um, and actually this is what gave the black uh, 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 labor movement its, its strength, which is that it was at the heart of the political economy of South Africa. Uh, the Palestinians are not at the heart of the political economy in Israel. The Palestinian case is closer to the American case than the South African case. Uh, in the American case, the Indian population was expelled from the political uh, body uh, known as the United States of America. They did not have to be moved physically, but they were put outside of that political body. They did not belong, even though physically they were inside the US politically, they were not, they were external to the US. Um, so if you are made external, then of course the question of alliances becomes even more important, even more central. And I believe the question of alliances in the uh, Palestinian case to be critical at two levels. One is the alliance between a hugely fragmented population, refugees, people in the occupied territories, and people inside Israel. That's, it somehow, it parallels a little bit the South African case where the challenge between hardcore South Africa and the Bantustan, how to ally the, the groups in, 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 in these two, Presented a slightly similar challenge, although not as great as the one in as the one in uh, Israel, South Africa. So that's the first challenge. The second challenge is inside South Africa itself, just as in in, in I'm, I'm sorry, inside Israel itself, just as in South Africa, the creation of the alliance between blacks in the Bantustans in core South Africa, then rethinking the notion of black between Indian colored African, and then finally fragmenting the cohesion of the white support behind the South African state. Okay, that's the challenge. I mean, I think in, in those, those three steps to me sum up the challenge. Um, and I agree with you completely that I think, yes, I will accept that criticism. Uh, the the uh, pre-82 struggle it should not be considered as external to the body of Palestinians uh, because it, it's, it's a struggle with its social base amongst refugees. I, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a great insight and, and, and I'm very happy to, to learn something from that. Um, <clears throat> So we come to BDS. Uh, look, I have no concrete and specific suggestions as to which institutions, uh, which companies, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a general principle. And, and the general principle I'm talking about is that the principle of whatever emerges as an anti-Zionist or a non-Zionist force should be something that we ought to relate to differently from how we relate to Zionist forces. That's, that's the simple statement. On a, on, a, on, a, on a slightly more complicated level, I am saying that we are at a period where we should not look at everything that preceded BDS as negative, but we should take the gains of what preceded BDS and build on it because the major gain of what preceded BDS was the Balad movement and its insistence on a state of all people, right? For what, what uh, I find slightly perplexing uh, is the relative silence on the nature of the polity uh, behind which one needs to mobilize a, a future post-Zionist policy and therefore the nature of the mobilization under Zionism itself. And I wish to call for 
as rich a set of alliances, as broad a movement um, without uh, in any way uh, sort of turning it into just uh, a, a, a movement which has no texture. Um, so that's, that's my initial reflection on what you said. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mahmoud. I mean, we, we certainly agree on the motivations and uh, that's why I, I believe that uh, even, even though one can defer on some, some of the parts of what you say, it's a very stimulating book and I think a very useful contribution to this whole discussion about all the, 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 the cases that you discussed. That's a very important actually contribution and very welcome one. Uh, now we will shift to, to the, the questions of, uh, of the audience and let me suggest the following. I will kind of read three, four questions at a time and then give you the floor as we would be proceeding in a, in a room, in a hall. You know, take three, four questions and then give you the floor and we proceed like this within the, the time that we have. We still have 30 minutes. So uh, we should be able to take a, a number of, of questions. And I, I will uh, take them on a basis of uh, first come, first served, as, you would, as we would do actually in, a, in, a, in a, an amphitheater. Um, the, the first question that was posed it was about the uh, Indian-Pakistani uh, case, the South Asian uh, uh, case. Um, and the, 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 the question is, how is your frame, uh, your framework, your, uh, uh, your analytic, uh, analytical frame applicable to uh, this, the partition and Pakistan, India, this, this case? That's one question. A second question is about uh, the role of armed struggle uh, in the uh, South African uh, uh, process in, in changing the mindsets. Uh, that's the question uh, about that in, in the transition to democracy. Um, there is a third question. Well, that's uh, some which a kind of personal question. Someone asking whether you intend to uh, um, uh, to to to. to um, I mean, if you look at what you're doing uh, as a conceptual autobiography, I mean, this is someone saying that uh, this book seems to this person based on the summary as a continuation of what you started in the previous book. So let me put it differently. Uh, how would you uh, uh, yourself describe this book in the evolution of your thinking on, on those issues with which you have been dealing indeed for, uh, for a very long time? Uh, and well, the last question, and then I give you the floor back, Mahmoud, is um, uh, your uh, reflection on the distinction that seems to exist between uh, uh, Biko's, Biko's account of political blackness and the emerging Afro-pessimism school of, of thought. Uh, so to what degree does the divergent experience of colonization account for these distinct traditions of thought? Uh, I presume you're reading the, the question at the same time, so you will have gotten uh, the, 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 the substance of it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, uh, the first question on the Indian-Pakistani case, uh, I'm asking myself the same question. Uh, it, it should already be clear from the discussion so far uh, that no two situations are quite alike, uh, that one cannot really work by analogy. Uh, you can make comparisons provided you have studied each case uh, in its uh, singularity. Um, so I did not have a chapter on the Indian Pakistani case uh, because I did not really quite have an answer to the question. Uh, how, how would my framework explain it? And uh, one day, I hope, a few years from now, I have that answer. And when I do, I will write another book about it. So we'll have to postpone this discussion until then, if you don't mind. Um, the role of the armed struggle in the South African process. Well, the armed struggle begins in South Africa 
as a as an import, um, as an import in a period when uh, uh, the armed struggle is considered the most uh, uh, dramatically successful uh, mode of uh, opposing uh, uh, colonialism and occupation, uh, particularly the, the Vietnam War, um, the, the struggle in Vietnam itself, but also inside Africa, uh, Algeria and Mozambique. Uh, when Mandela goes out, he go, goes out, he goes to Algeria, um, and uh, and he goes to organize an armed struggle. Uh, my own verdict on the armed struggle is not as enthusiastic as you might want me to be. Uh, the armed armed struggle dislocated. Uh, the struggle from within South Africa, and mind you, South Africa is still a country where the vast majority of the black population was inside South Africa, um, and where there were few refugees, not many refugees, is dislocated it outside. And they did not create from refugees militants of the armed struggle, but they actually took militants from inside South Africa to train them into uh, uh, guerrillas, uh, armed guerrillas outside South Africa in camps, whether in Nyachingwea, in, in, in Tanzania, or, or in um, Algeria, or other places. And, and the unexpected result was that the more militants they took out, uh, the more pacific South African society became. So the period of the armed struggle, the 1960s, was is almost to me like a period of a graveyard silence. It is the period of maximum foreign investment in South Africa. It is the period of secondary industrialization of South Africa. That period comes to an end with when the struggle comes back home. And the struggle comes back home when the students break out of their isolated discussion groups and move to mobilize particular sectors of society, whether uh, migrant labor uh, in, in, in the hostels or residents of, of, of townships and communities. Uh, a new mindset begins then, not with the armed struggle. Third question. Is this my conceptual vocabulary biography? Uh, you, you're giving me too much credit, but but I'll tell you how I think about this. Uh, you know, 12 years ago in 2010, I took I, I took a job at uh, as director of Makerere Institute of Social Research. Um, I cut down my presence at Columbia to uh, one semester, four months, and. I spent eight months at Makerere. I gave up my academic summer. And at Makerere, after two years, we set up a PhD program. And in the PhD program, it was based on a single, one single departure from existing programs, which was that we said, we are not an area studies program. We do not believe in studying Africa in isolation. We believe in a study, not only just of Africa, but we, we believe in reintegrating Africa into the world. And we believe in studying the world, for, but from an African vantage point, because the world cannot just be studied from no vantage point. That's the business of God. Okay, for humans, we have to have some vantage point somewhere, some, some place, Edward Saidian notion. Okay, some place, uh, uh, and, and, and our place to understand the world was, was inside Africa. And this book uh, expands, uh, it, it, it expands my, my, the terrain of, 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 of my, my, my thinking, my, my endeavor um, from, from colonialism now to, to, to political modernity, uh, from, from Africa, uh, to, 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 to a global platform, in a sense. The case studies uh, uh, can, cannot be defined uh, in terms of area studies. 
they, they make sense only thematically. Um, I'm now in the process of researching a book on Idi Amin. Um, so that, uh, I, I, I think that would be more biographical because this is a whole period to which I was witness and which, which in many ways shaped my life. Um, I hope uh, in another few years I'll have that, I'll have that out. Finally, uh, reflections on the distinction between, between Biko's uh, black consciousness and the Afro-pessimism school. Uh, I mean, I think the two schools are very far apart. Uh, the the Afro-pessimism school uh, is, uh, it essentializes uh, uh, the notion of, uh, of African. Uh, it essentializes and generalizes the experience of, uh, of the slave in the US uh, to even the periods after the formal abolition of slavery. Uh, it has some very interesting, illuminating and educative remarks on the nature of uh, violence to which uh, African Americans have been subject to, whether during slavery or after slavery, as gratuitous violence, uh, and from that I have I have learned I have learned a lot. But it's basically transhistorical, um, and, uh, and and I think that distinguishes it it from from uh, Biko and Black consciousness. Thank you. Thank you, Mahmoud. <clears throat> Another uh, round of questions. If Okay, you, um, first one is about, uh, is ethnic violence inherent to the nationhood model? And uh, I mean, it's- I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Yeah, is, is what? ethnic vi violence, is it inherent to the nationhood model? And uh, I mean, can we, uh, or to put it otherwise, as long as we operate within nation states, violence, isn't it intrinsic to the model? That's a question. Uh, another question is about the, uh, the way that the Jewish settlement in Palestine was sponsored by uh, 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 institutional power from, from, from abroad. And therefore the question is about the role of international institutions and their failure to get implementation of legal resolutions uh, uh, in in uh, in this uh, uh, in this case, uh, a third question. Well, again relating to the uh, nation state, uh, uh, someone is asking, uh, why do you think the idea of moving beyond a nation state is, is seen as as radical, even by people who do not actually benefit from it, uh, like members of the minority? That's the question. Um, and maybe a last question for this round. Afrikaners do not have a secure home as a minority in South Africa. And that seems to be the general consensus among uh, the young Afrikaners who have left the country in droves. So what do you comment on this? Um, okay, I'm also taking notes as you talk. Um, Okay, the first one, uh, ethnic violence. Um, look, I, I make a distinction between uh, uh, ethnicity and uh, tribalism. Uh, ethnicity to me is a cultural construct. Um, it is not a territorial construct. Uh, People in an ethnic group live in many places. They, they, they share the same culture without sharing the same territory. Uh, in, the, in the colonization of Africa, um, key to, 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 to the transition from ethnicity to tribe uh, was to territorialize ethnic identity, to declare a homeland for each ethnic group. And therefore to declare all others who do not belong to their ethnic group as minorities 
as political minorities not entitled to participate in self-governance within that group. Um, political mi minority is, is, a, is a political concept which only comes into being with the creation of a nation, of a, of a type of power which is identified with a nation. Um, and, and this is the distinction that so my, my, my move is to say that really what we should be doing is to deterritorialize uh, 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 ethnicity, uh, is, to, is to let culture flourish regardless of boundaries and to have the administration within boundaries as an administration which does not is not based on the notion of majority and minority within within the, because majority and minority will render both the majority and the minority permanent and and if we are interested in democracy at all uh, then we must think of majority and minority as the result of a democratic process it cannot you cannot have majorities and minorities before the democratic process only to be confirmed by the democratic process uh, if we have that, then democracy will only be inside the national majority. There will be no, no democracy within the nation as a whole, within the, within the country as a whole. So I'm talking of, of, of decoupling state from nation. Why do minorities await the role of international institutions and their failure to enforce? Well, this is, uh, I mean, you are absolutely right. Uh, this is uh, the history of Zionism. Uh, wh whether the hist whether it's uh, French finance capital, which was backing Zionism in the early phases, or the British state, uh, which which saw Zionism as a as a as a very helpful conduit, uh, or, or 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 the different institutions created by Zionists, which which raised funds uh, in different parts of, of of the Western world, um, and and how they, they, they functioned uh, with minimal or scant or complete disregard uh, of uh, uh, the rule of law internationally. Um, now, this is, what, this is what BDS is doing. This is the strong side of BDS, uh, is to direct our attention uh, to this international arena. Uh, which is more or less devoid of laws and ethics in terms of how how things move, how things are tolerated uh, and, and allowed to move. Um, next question is, why do minorities who do not benefit from the nation state continue to support it? Well, look, two reasons. So long as minorities think that there's no alternative to the nation state. So long as they think that the nation state is part of the natural landscape, then the only alternative they would see is to establish their own nation state. And this is the dilemma. Everybody wants their own nation state. This is, this is the explanation behind the constant an ever-growing scale of violence. Um, that's the um, young Afrikaners leaving the country in droves. Well, I don't know about droves. I don't really know the numbers. But the thing is, uh, I know that there is a big contrast between how Algerians left. I mean, French left Algeria, uh, and Afrikaners South Africa. Um, if, if they had left in droves, we would have a very different uh, South Africa and very different uh, socioeconomic uh, situation there. Um, but yes, they are leaving, they're leaving. And let's, let's grant that they're leaving in significant numbers, um, significant enough to, 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 to warrant us to, to, to think about it. Um, I mean, look, I, 
when I talk of South Africa and when I talk of 1994, uh, I said very clearly that black consciousness could have become a, 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 another black nationalist movement. Okay, and there were strong uh, uh, pressures from within it to become that. It could have been, it could have become the movement that stopped South Africa at the point where we say we want an independent South Africa, a nation state of the majority, black South Africa, right? But somehow I became interested in the transition from this notion of black majority to the notion of a non-racial majority. Mm -hmm. How did this come about, right? So, and amongst Afrikaners also, there were those, those who joined uh, the UDF, uh, but there were also those who wanted a, a homeland for the, for the Afrikaners to feel safe and secure, a homeland where they could set up their own uh, political power. Um, yeah, they have left. But now, there are also people beginning to study about those who left and whether they are staying where they went. Uh, because the leaving, the leaving uh, makes sense only from the point of view of the fact that we lost a nation state. This was our state, we lost it. And of course, we expect them to behave as we did. Right? Um, there was a book published by an Africano reporter called My Traitor's Heart uh, in, um, during, during the elections in 1994. It became a bestseller in South Africa. And uh, the guy who wrote the book was, uh, uh, he was the great grandson of one of the first Afrikaner prime ministers. His name was Rian Malan and his father was Malan, a, a, a former state president. Um, and he wrote the book called My Traitor's Heart. And, he, Rian Malan was a journalist for the Johannesburg Star and he was on the crime beat and he covered black on black violence in uh, uh, African townships. So there's a chapter in each chapter is devoted to a different kind of black on black violence. There's one chapter uh, devoted to a, a, it's called the hammer man. The hammer man is this big black guy, muscular, strong, who wields a hammer at his victim. And even if the victim has no, nothing more than just a wallet in his pocket and, 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 and in the wallet is just a hundred rand or 40 rand or whatever, he wields the hammer and smashes the skull and the victim is dead. And then he goes with the loot. And Rian Malan's the uh, uh, unstated conclusion is this, that look, if they can do this to their own people with so little gain, what will they do to us? Okay, that's what he was saying. Uh, well, when the referendum came and the white population voted whether to continue negotiations with what were called liberation movements, the majority voted to continue negotiations in spite of the message in this book. So it's an open question. I, I, I'm not, I'm saying let's learn from the lessons of South Africa without, but I'm not saying that there is no, there are no issues here to be thought through critically. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's not easy to come to an alternative to a nation state a non-nation state, a state of, you know, a, a state which separates nation from state, not easy. Um, but I think there would be something to gain if we looked at the kind of polities before colonialism. Um, most African countries I have studied places, pre-colonial polities, they were not nation polities. Uh, <clears throat> They were multi-ethnic, all of them that I know. Uh, in fact, if anything, uh, the idea of, of, of 
segregate, segregation is a very modern idea. The pre-modern idea, even amongst empires, is not segregation, it's assimilation. If anything, the assimilation is aggressive. If anything, the, the critique targets them for forcible assimilation, for forcible conversion, etc., but not segregation. Right? So it's a it's a very different kind of political culture. And we may learn, learn something if we if we if we read it on its own terms rather than through modern lenses. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mahmoud. Uh, uh, I have to apologize to the audience, but there is no way at all that we could take all your questions. There are too many of them, far too many. Just imagine the reproduction of some this kind of meeting in a in a in a theater. The, there there would be no way anyway to take sixty seven questions on board. So. Uh, uh, time is almost uh, uh, off. Uh, let me take one final question, one final question in the singular, uh, be, uh, so to, to give you enough time to, to answer it, and that will be the, 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 the last one in this uh, uh, very interesting uh, uh, evening, very interesting session. So the question is about, I mean, let me read the question itself, what, uh, under which conditions immigration becomes settler colonialism. I mean, if you could dwell on this uh, difference between immigration and settler colonialism. And the background to the question uh, is the discourse of settler colonialism that is occurring today in Kashmir and Assam in India, uh, where uh, Indian state, the Indian state continues its occupation of Kashmir. Uh, and in Assam where NRC, uh, a disenfranchisement exercise has happened based on a subnationalism that holds Bengali minorities as infiltrators and settlers. So, how would you comment on all that, on this very complex situation? I see that. I see. I would not be surprised if the same friend who asked the first question has now come back with the last question. Because th 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 this is the first question. Can I comment on the India-Pakistan? Um, but I will comment on the first part of the question, which is the uh, difference between immigration and settler colonialism. And, and I think I, uh, maybe you came late, but uh, uh, my, the first part of my talk uh, discussed uh, that an immigrant is a person who comes uh, willingly to be part of the existing polity. Uh, and, and, and the advantages this person wants in the polity are socioeconomic, either equality or advantage, but comes to become integrated into the existing polity. A settler is a person who comes to establish an alternate polity, to destroy the existing polity and to set up a new polity. That's basically my answer. I'm sorry, I cannot, I cannot talk of uh, Kashmir and Bihar. Um, yes, of course, the Kashmiris are learning a lot from the Israeli, not the Kashmiris, I'm sorry. The Indian state is learning a lot from Israel. Uh, and in fact, the Kashmiri project is very much reads like a, a second generation project that the Israelis would <coughs> attempt it. Okay, well, we're, we're about, I mean, we are, we, we reached the end of, of this session. And uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Mamdani, for this very interesting, very stimulating talk and for this, this very important contribution, your book, uh, to all these discussions. Actually, you, we had only a glimpse at some parts of the book. There are uh, other chapters that haven't been even evoked in the discussion about Germany, about Sudan, uh, about uh, other issues. So this is a very rich book, very stimulating. And I uh, uh, reiterate my uh, encouragement to, to everyone to, 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 to read the book, very interesting uh, uh, work. So thank you again. And thank you to the organizers of, uh, of this event, uh, to Dina Matar and Nargis Farzad and to Aki Elborzi, who is the 
person who set up all this, uh, the, 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 the meeting itself and has been running it. So thank you to all and uh, uh, very best wishes since this is the beginning of the year, uh, the 2021, and that's our first event. So happy new year to everyone, despite the, the, the poor beginning, all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you to everybody. Thank you to the organizers. And uh, do read the book, whether you read it in the library or whether you buy it, that's not the main point. Main point is do read the book. Thank you. Good.